everyone. Uh, welcome to today's PTRC Fireside Chat. Um, I'm Brogan. Just a quick introduction for PTRC. Um, we are a training company that's based in the UK that specializes in the training of transport planners, engineers, designers, and placemakers. Uh, we are also part of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, the membership organization for professionals leading the movement of goods and people. Since April, we've had seven of these fireside discussions uh, leading to some great conversations and modeling has been one that we've been wanting to have a chat about for a while. So I'm very much looking forward to today um, with the modeling royalty as someone on LinkedIn described it. <laughs> um, so welcome, I hope you guys enjoy and I'll hand over to Glenn now. Thanks very much, Brogan. Uh, and yet, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, or at least good afternoon to those of you in uh, this side of the world. Uh, my name's Glenn Lyons. I'm the Mott McDonald Professor of Future Mobility at UWE Bristol in the UK. And I'm delighted to be chairing this PTRC event, the seventh, I think, in the Fireside Chat series. And as Brogan said, today we turn our attention to modelling. A very warm welcome to all of you in our audience who've joined us live today on the 3rd of December 2020. I'm told we've had nearly 700 people register. Do please make use of the chat window on YouTube to share your views and raise questions you'd like our panel to address. And a warm welcome too if you're watching this later as a recording. This event series has a, a focus on the transport implications of the pandemic and the societal response. Our first fireside chat was on the 23rd of April, exactly a month after the UK went into its first lockdown. At the time, huge numbers of people were a few weeks into full-time working from home. But many perhaps still assumed that a few weeks would be it before going back to normal. Yet here we are, several months on, still existing in an extended behaviour change experiment. It's clear that we're in a state of flux. Public transport struggling to survive. Many people have now got a taste for more walking and cycling. Many intend or would like to continue working from home, sometimes at least. Car traffic is said to have returned, but why and in what way and with what future trajectory is not clear. Will people ever want to fly as much for business again, now they're well practiced in using online tools for digital connectivity? What is to become of property values, rental markets and city centre retail if people don't come back to work? And what happens when you mix in a climate emergency? Add all this together and it would be hard to argue that the outlook is not deeply uncertain. So how do we plan for this uncertain future and make investment decisions with confidence? What form and function should transport analysis take? And in particular, what can modelling do to help? Strategic modelling that is. Well, today is our chance to discuss this. And as Brogan's already mentioned, we have an excellent panel with us with which to do so. Indeed, modelling royalty, no less. So, no pressure. I'll be inviting panel members to provide their introductory remarks shortly, but I'd first like to set the scene a little further. The title for the event was inspired by thinking about George Box's quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Being a logical person, I thought that it stands to reason that what follows is that one can also say, all models are wrong, but some are useless. The problem, it seems to me, arises when we succumb to the notion that any model is right when it comes to offering insights into the future. And I'm afraid to say that implicitly, I think we are in a system that does tend to succumb to this. Many of you will know, incidentally, that I loathe false precision. Here's an example quickly. Traffic growth is predicted to be roughly 44%. Well, we have created a world of transport analysis often nested within transport appraisal, where there's a sense that the might of the model can help us break through the uncertainty about the future. We use models to distinguish between do nothing and do something futures and produce numbers that are turned into assessments of cost and benefit and convince ourselves that we have a handle on things. Now, I hasten to add that I'm not criticizing models themselves here necessarily, but how they're used. My good colleague and futurist, Andrew Curry, who I work with on scenario planning says, scenarios make you think. This is very important. If you've had the chance to read Kay and King's recent book called Radical Uncertainty, Decision-Making for an Unknowable Future, you will know that the critical question they keep coming back to is this, what is going on here? 
To me, modelling should make us think. It should help us think and support us in being able to really ask of the system we're trying to represent and analyse, what is going on here? In effect, we need to consider form and function when it comes to models. Are we using them in the right way to best inform and support decision-making and investment? And are the models we have of the right form to best fulfil the sort of function that's now needed? Here we run up against the norms within our systems of appraisal, analysis and modelling. Systems that have been evolved over decades. We have transport appraisal guidance, which presumably strongly reflects those norms and certainly influences them. But it's just that, guidance. There are not strict rights and wrongs when it comes to making sense of an unknown future. At the heart of matters, I believe, is what we understand by the notion of analytical robustness. For me, I would say simply, it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. And let's face it, approximately right should really mean helping us think. Because with the best will in the world, the input data about the future is going to be wrong, and the relationships wired into the model itself may very well be wrong for a mobility system that's in transition, in a state of flux, if you like. Ergo, the modelling results will be wrong. We need models of a form that can fulfil a function of helping us to think, to ask what is going on here, and then in turn support our decision makers. My friend Stephen Cragg at Transport Scotland would say that these musings amount to transport philosophy. To quote a dictionary definition, philosophy means a theory or attitude that acts as a guiding principle for behaviour. Are our guiding principles for modelling therefore appropriate? Well, I think it's something to give serious attention to now, especially in light of COVID-19. So, I would suggest that knowing all models are wrong is our starting point, while the important question becomes, how do we ensure that they can be useful? And with that, I'll now turn to our panel and invite Helen to take the mic first off. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, by, by way of a very brief introduction, my, my background is I've spent my whole of my working life either in consultancy or local government. Um, about seven or eight years ago, my previous job before my current one, I, I joined the Welsh government which was quite a strange transition from consultancy into the civil service, quite a culture shock, I must say. But on the first day I walked in, the, um, the lady who ran transport for Welsh Government at the time, who in the way of the civil service had come from environment, um, said, Helen, your job title is going to be Head of Transport Evidence. And I just thought that was great um, because, yes, I'd been brought in because I can build transport models, but I think as all transport modellers, we should primarily be transport planners and have a broad understanding and appreciation of what's happening in the world around us. So I saw my role as being involved in having to understand the issues that are being faced by decision and policy makers and bringing into that debate um, perspective, experience, expertise, um, and the issues as they come from the transport perspective and to provide evidence, some of that evidence, I believe can often usefully come from using a transport model. But I'd also like to make the point very briefly that I also believe that modelling is about much more than trying to predict the future and not saying in 2051 on this particular piece of road between eight and nine in the morning, there's going to be 63 and a half vehicles um, using the road. Um, one of the things I keep to my um, side is an article by Joshua Epstein in 2008, who talks about why we model. And apart from prediction, he has 16 um, other reasons, one of which I particularly enjoy, which is expose prevailing wisdom as incompatible with available data. Um, but one of the things that we do when we as modelers are building a model do and what is going on in that part of the world we have abstracted into our model. And one of the things that we do is we gain an understanding not only of what's going on in the current system, but also what are the sort of key aspects and main sensitivities and the things that can, can make a difference, which again is something that Kay and King pick up in their book. Um, 
I used to really enjoy when I worked for Kent County Council going to meetings with representatives from environment, from health, from transport working together to work at how we could redevelop the area. And one of the things that we discovered from the transport model was that we wanted to have a bus rapid transit system, but one of the key things that affected people's um, willingness to use the system was actually what was happening in parking charges. So then led into a discussion about what's happening to parking charges at the main attractors at the area in the hospital, in the shopping centre, how people are going to get to the university and also a land use issue, which I'm sure Tim will bring up at some stage. Where are we going to site the new college campus that so fits in with the transport system? So I feel that as modelers, we gain an understanding of what's going on in, in an area that we can bring to the table, to the discussions. I'd also just like to close on a quote from Phil Goodwin that I always keep in my mind. Good models will tell you a lot of things that you already knew and a few things you hadn't thought about. And uh, I always bear that in mind. I look at a model, what am I learning through the process of building a model and then through using the model and looking at what the model um, is bringing to my attention. That's great. That, that's Thank you, Helen. Um, I, love, I love the idea of um, focusing on evidence rather than modelling per se, um, which, which seems a good way to start. Uh, so with that, we'll move over to Tom. Thanks, Glenn. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, Tom van Duren, um, I'm a technical director at Mott McDonald and uh, also a visiting professor at the Institute for Transport Studies at the University of Leeds. Many of you will know me as the chair of Modeling World, which we've been running with Landor since 2006. Now, of course, I must disagree with Glenn's you know, line of thought that if all models are wrong and some are useful, that some are useless. Yeah, where I would want to be at the end of this call, and which I fully believe, is that although all models are wrong, all models are use useful. Because they help us provide insight, they help us identify the key assumptions. Helen has, has already uh, identified an example of that. The assumptions that affect the anticipated success of an intervention or a policy. They allow, and that is so important, a quantified and evidence-based discussion if people are willing to enter in the discussion on that basis. So if there's anything wrong with models, I think is the way in which we've used them, uh, and particularly in which we have used model results uh, and sometimes misused model results. And it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, if we can use mod models to, to better understand what's happening in a complex and dynamic world by formalizing these relationships, and by using that to, um, to look into alternatives, then uh, models are and, uh, in inevitably and will always be useful. And therefore, um, I think rather than the question that Glenn asked on whether we are asking models the wrong questions, I think we're asking modelers the wrong questions. We are just not using our models in a way that help, help us in identifying those real issues that we need to focus on in our transport planning. Um, so models are never useless. Model results may be useless if, if, if people are not, not, not um, in a position to understand the theory that led to those results or the assumptions that fed into the models to lead to those results. Models are calculators. If I may refer also to uh, uh, another uh, a member of royalty in transport modeling, Hugh Gunn. Um, used to say that models are calculators, um, and uh, and he's right. Leave it to the modelers to do the calculations, but let's talk about the assumptions that go into the calculations. And that's a responsibility not just for the modelers. That's a calculation for anyone who engages in transport planning, uh, and 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 will use models and model results in their work. Uh, I'll leave it there for the time being, Glenn. Thank you, Tom. Um, I can't help but help overcome the resistance to uh, your challenge on all models are, are useful. Um, I suppose um, some models are useful but uselessly used, I'm going to suggest. 
Um, but I, I think you're absolutely right to focus upon the importance of discussion. Um, so the model itself is an enabler. Um, Maybe I should throw the word usually. Maybe all I want to do is throw the word usually in there that you hadn't had forgotten to use yourself <laughs> in that in that particular sentence. <laughs> okay, um, thanks, Tom. Great introductory remarks, and I and I should probably point out that yes, indeed, the modelling royal family is bigger than the one you see on screen, but we just couldn't get everyone uh, up on stage today. So apologies to those who aren't there, aren't here with us. Uh, Charlene, over to you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Welcome, everybody. My name is Charlene Rohr. I'm a senior research leader at RAND Europe, and I'm co-director of RAND Europe's Center for Future and Foresight Studies. I've been involved in developing transport travel demand models with a number of people here today um, for nearly 30 years. And in the last decade, I've been involved in using futures methods to better understand and deal with uncertainty, particularly in transport. So I'm really delighted, really, to be here today to discuss this provocative question of whether all models are wrong, especially after a pandemic. I think my starting point is the first question that Glenn provided in the background material for this talk about has the pandemic heightened challenges for strategic modeling? I think my answer would be a sort of disappointing not so much. Well, it's true that the pandemic has highlighted a number of uncertainties that Glenn has, has talked about, about whether urbanization trends will continue, whether ever improving digital services will continue to make it easier to work from home, to shop. Someone mentioned to see our doctors, maybe even for education in the future. Um, I would argue that such uncertainties were always lurking and that our strategic planning approaches really need to take account of these and other important uncertainties that we're not talking about since the pandemic, for example, the impact of autonomous vehicles. Further, I don't think that such uncertainties mean that we should just throw up our hands and say all our models are wrong or this is too difficult, but I, I will take the point that our models need to be used in different ways. First, I, need, I would argue that we need to wean ourselves off the ideas that our models can predict the future. No model can do that. If, we, if they could do that, I think we would all be wealthier, <laughs> certainly, and in different um, situations than being here today. But they can help us plan and take better decisions. And that's what this should be about. They're a treasure trove of what we know about be travel behavior, as other people have already mentioned. So we shouldn't use our models to predict the future, but instead we should use them to explore how proposed policies and investments may work across a range of future scenarios to stress test our proposed policy decisions. Just as you would do if you were making a big household decision like buying a house. You'd look at the costs, look at potential future scenarios. For example, how many people might support mortgage payments? What would happen if someone lost their job? How easier would it get a second job? What if interest rates increase? Should you buy insurance? What if you had to sell? Should you buy a smaller house? There's exactly the sorts of thinking that people would do in that situation. And we can apply a similar approach to transport planning decisions to help us understand in what conditions or under what assumptions our policies and investments will work. And more importantly, when they will not. Our models can help us to pinpoint those factors that are absolutely critical in terms of that success, to help us identify trade-offs between not unreasonable choices, and to help us think about better about whether and how we can better future-proof our policies so that they have a better chance of success. Many sectors already use models in this way. My colleagues at RAND call this, this approach to the use of models robust decision-making. And they use it to support planning in a range of sectors that are subject to what we call, what they call deep uncertainty. And I would argue that transport is in the same place. There are essentially four elements to robust decision-making. And I think all of them have, we've picked up here. First, the need to consider a multiplicity of plausible and diverse futures. Second, to seek robust rather than opt optimal strategies. Robust strategies are those that perform, perform well compared to alternatives over a wide range of plausible futures. Third, to employ adaptive strategies to achieve robustness. 
Adaptive strategies are designed to evolve over time in response to new information. Generally, such strategies reflect decision-making rules that are organized around near-term decisions, signposts to monitor, and contingency actions to take in response to those signals. Fourth, and finally, the computer and the model are there to facilitate human deliberation over what scenarios we explore, over the potential options to address the problem and the trade-offs that we need to make. Using transport models in this way will require model simplification in my view. But perhaps the best way to develop simpler models is to use our current models as a starting point on the basis that they reflect a meta-analysis of what we know about current travel. So in summary, I say let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need models and tools to help us plan for the future, particularly in this environment of deep uncertainty. But we need to use our models in a different way and to develop plans that are robust across a wide range of plausible futures, rather than identify the ones that are optimum in a few. I'll Thank stop. you very much, Charlene. Uh, that, that was fantastic. Um, and I think you, you outlined fantastically um, the, the dual need of understanding form and function um, when we come to ensuring that models prove useful um, in what we need to achieve from them. So that, that's, that's, that's great. Um, Without further ado, onwards to Tim. And incidentally, thank you to the audience. Um, it's clearly getting very lively over there in YouTube, judging by the stream that we're seeing being fed across to the panel. So please keep it coming. Um, although it's testing my multitasking skills, I can assure right. you. Um, Tim, over to you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Glenn. Um, uh, since we're doing little mini bios, I should, I, I think, I'll introduce myself as a, as an imposter as a modeler because I started out as an operational researcher and, and worked in a couple of different industries, uh, post office and and water supply, but always with a focus on supply and demand, trying to understand what the demand was and what our supply was to to meet that. Um, and I moved into the rail ind industry and peak travel modeling first of all and then into land use and transport and I even occasionally use assignment models um, but there are so many modelers out there and such a great proportion of our transport modelers who are much more expert at highway assignment than me so I generally tend to leave it to them. Um, so first of all what I want to say is that there's clearly a bit of revolution in the air into the feeling of, of huge change in terms of transport demand and the solutions that we offer and sort of bubbling under approaches and saying should we be doing something different um, but uh, just just taking you know we all have to take Glenn to task on the title of this session and my 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 response is that if if all models are wrong then your new models that you're proposing to solve all the problems with our with, with the ones we've got now are also wrong um, and we have to be we have to be realistic about that and think about how we evolve rather than have revolution. I'm going to I'm going to reclaim a phrase from that from, from, I remember from the 1990s here uh, for this. I'm going to say we have to go back to basics in our understanding of why we're modeling and what we're doing with our with our models. So we were explaining clearly what what they're doing. Um, we know that COVID has shaken, shaken up travel demand. The frequencies and the times of travel have, have altered. We can't predict whether that's going to endure as a change or whether it's going to slowly diminish over time or kick us into some new reality. So we've got to think about the basic things we know and that our, we have understood not just through modelling, but through, through measures such as the National Travel Survey about people making, making trips. Um, we have to we we have to think that and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. Uh, Glenn's got it up behind him. The four stage model gives us a very good, um, not just a not just a model itself, but a philosophical way of thinking about 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 travel travel demand. Um, and we know that we can we can understand the underlying demand patterns better than a lot of observed data. Often we we confirm our observed data by using a four stage model and a synthetic model mobile phone data particularly, but it's not just that. Some traffic counts we look at and go, do they make sense once we plug together with the land use and the trip rates? Um, so we've got to we've got to got to got to have faith in that. Um, 
but we know that our models are often wrong because the because the assumptions we put in about the future are wrong. Charlene's touched on that, and uh, the, you know, economics, technology, attitudinal changes we can't predict. So we've got to we've got to understand where we're putting in levers that actually express something that we don't know. But the mechanisms we've got are, are probably fairly plausible as to how people make their decisions and the balance they, they have. When it comes to COVID, we've already seen people doing tests using those sorts of levers. I know Transport for Wales have looked at, you know, what's the, the impact of 30% of the population working from home? And they were able to come up with some pretty plausible results in their model that the, the traffic levels wouldn't drop as much because other, other um, mechanisms mean that people use up all that precious peak time uh, road space by switching mode and time of day and rerouting. So we 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 can understand that with our models. Um, but a quick word about the other part of the basics. Um, our modeling is about people who are modelers, this very small profession of modelers with a very complex task. And it's about the people we work for, the questions they ask us, we've already had that. And, and we model because we're paid for certain questions. So we've got to we've got to understand that we can't transform our modelers into different people and have twice as many doing different techniques instantly. And also we've got to look at the process that we feed into. So that's my back to basics about thinking about that in order to evolve what we do, um, not to have a revolution in what we do, uh, because that uncertainty about the way we do things while we're uncertain about transport demands, transport demand itself could actually just 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 leave us not knowing what what's going on at all. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, and I very much like your phrase: "Modeling is about the people who are the modelers." And I think that links back to Tom's opening comments, including reminding us that models versus modelers is an important distinction. Uh, and for me, those points in turn link back to what Charlene emphasised, which is this is about human deliberation. Um, and perhaps we might come back after we've, we've heard from Amanda about what the panel makes of the importance of deliberation and the people involved, as opposed to the models as kind of devices and, and, and tools, which in, them, in and of themselves aren't really the ultimate you know, um, determinant of the outcomes. Anyway, with that, um, to our last but not least panellist, uh, Amanda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, I'm Amanda Rowlett and I'm Chief Analyst at the Department for Transport. Um, I've been there for six years and before that moved around a number of government departments as an economist and then progressively as Chief Economist. So whilst I've learned a lot about models and a huge regard for both models and modelers, um, I'm here as much as, a, as, a, as, a, as an active user of models. And obviously my comments here will be my own views, not, um, not those of my department. We've talked, obviously, we're talking here about COVID and uncertainty. So it might be worth just, remind, just reiterating what the current um, impact of um, COVID has been on usage. Um, and I mean, we've heard a lot about the impact on, on rail and on tube trains, and indeed, uh, we're still seeing a quarter of the normal trips, so a spectacular impact there, but fortuitously, on, a, on average, fairly close to the socially distancing capacity of uh, rail and tube, on average, overall. Bus, we've got more like half of um, the old numbers of people using it. Um, and cars were actually up to three quarters of the trips that we had even during the lockdown, which is quite striking. If you look underneath that, we see that um, uh, commuting has pretty well continued, but there's been a drop off in uh, non-commuting non trips. And then reassuringly, freight trips are about the same as they were before. So we are all getting our stuff, even if it's delivered by a, a van rather than um, you and I going out and driving. So it has had a big impact on use, but there were some elements which actually haven't moved as much as we would have thought. Um, to say nothing of going into the area of whether people are actually following lockdown, which I think is very much outside the bounds of this. Um, the future. What does this tell us about the future? 
but it is hugely uncertain. Um, we will all have different views. And I think as modelers, as economists, um, uh, it's hard to grasp much that is firm evidence here. Uh, I mean, the um, opinion surveys are very clearly telling us that people expect to have a different um, pattern of working life, but we, we genuinely don't know whether the appeal of face-to-face -face and the fact you do better when you're with your colleagues in your office or wherever you come from is going to outweigh that, we, we, we don't know. Um, as, a, as a team, we are being asked um, uh, what's going to happen as the analysts in the DFT by our, by our masters. Um, and I note that Tim said one can't possibly predict it and it, it, we, 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 we do sympathise with that. So we do need to be able to look at a wide range of futures um, uh, and we need to look at a range of futures for a wide range of projects as well. So I think my first ask of the modelling community is um, can we evolve the models we have to get a quicker answers on what, how a new project would perform under different scenarios? Because at the moment, it costs a heck of a lot of money to get a new um, fundamentally different run out of the models. So what can we do to take what we've got? And I would agree very much with other speakers. We have unbelievably valuable tools that embody a, a huge amount of information on how people have traveled in the past, how they've reacted to change. So building on those is, is an, an eminently sensible thing to do. Um, but can we turn them around quicker? If we simplify them, do we still get meaningful insights for a high level assessment on projects? The second point I would make though, is when we're looking at, at change is, can we triangulate against a range of sources of information? Um, so we would ve we very much encourage development of, 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 of new modeling types and equally thinking what would need to be true for this model to happen? Can I, can I benchmark it against you know, changes that I've seen in other situations? So it comes back to the user of the model um, and, and, and indeed the modeler using that taking, I would want my modelers to think bigger picture, to think what, what's the, what, how does this sit within the world but then what I've seen before and what is the intuitive explanation of why these things change when we do different, put different inputs in? Um, the other key point I wanted to make is actually presenting uncertainty. I mean, having tried to explain to a minister why a project is a good idea when you're looking at three different scenarios, it's, it's actually remarkably difficult to explain. So you say, minister, well, if you look at this aspect, then you've got A, B or C, and it's more or less good. And if you look at that aspect, you've got D, E and F and that shows it's excellent. It's, it, it, it's very hard. So I think more work, and I know Glenn has done great work on this, looking at how you present uncertainty in a way that gives you a simple articulation. And frankly, if we can't explain it simply, people are just not going to use it. They will default to that single central line. I wonder whether it's easier having a lot of scenarios. So you describe the shape rather than taking three, but, but an important thing to look at. Um, bringing that together then, with a systemic change in um, potential futures, we need to look at the portfolio of projects as a whole, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, but to make sure that our transport needs as a whole are covered under different scenarios. So it is an exciting team. We've got brilliant tools to start with, a fantastic community, and I hope we can see it as not a, not a hill to climb, but a real opportunity to get to the summit and put that flag on top and say, right, we're, we're mapping the right way forward. That's great. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, even more food for thought. I'm, I'm struggling to see in my scribbled notes, you know, which important points to pick out. Um, I'm, I may have kind of will miss summarize what one of the things you said, but I, I very much like your idea of using the tools we already have, but looking at how we simplify them. But the natural nervousness, if, the, if we simplify, does that mean we lose um, accuracy or representation. And, and it strikes me that we're worrying there about whether our, whether our complex models are wrong as opposed to simple models being wrong, but we know they're all going to be wrong in inverted commas. And so I think it's partly about building that confidence as a set of modelers and in turn users um, to accept that that's not you know, inherently the case that we're devaluing the support models can give us by by going down that route. Um, well, let me just, um, as I said, the audience 
have been very busy as well. Um, and we will be coming back to that some more. Um, but I, I wanted to pick out, first of all, in relation to what um, Amanda um, has said, uh, Lindsay Oxlard in the audience is saying, how can we convince decision makers um, to trust our models? And I guess that comes right back to your um, hearing with the minister about three scenarios. But is that really the point? Is it about getting them to trust the models or to have more faith in a different way of articulating what the models are helping us to explore in the future? Who are you? <laughs> Sorry, to, back to you, Amanda, in the sense that it, you know, you're imagining the, imagining the minister on your shoulder. So are you really ever trying to explore to justify the models being right or robust, or is it more about um, articulating this complexity that's the problem? I think with the models, um, I mean, the transport community over the years has done a good job in sort of persuading decision makers that the models are robust and sensible. I think the difficulty with models comes when they are telling a different story from the minister's intuition and also we will have ministers who are thoughtful analytical people who who want to understand what's under the tin and the challenge there is is explaining in simple terms you know what goes in and what comes out without saying there's a four stage model here's a hugely complicated set of diagrams and it pops out the end but rather if you change this assumption you get that and 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 there's a here's the logic of it so, so there's a, a, an inbuilt positive, you know, trust, um, but but a need to explain it more. I think I think when we're looking at scenarios, I don't think they will be mistrusting the scenarios, but rather wanting to hear hear a simple story that they can get in their heads and intuitively understand. So, I think there's a there's a lot here about there's a lot here about about presentation rather than needing to build confidence. Thank you, and I, and I love your reference to, to minister's intuition, um, which takes us back to, I think, Helen reminded us of an Epstein um, reason for, for modeling, which is prevailing wisdom being incompatible with the data. Um, so of course, here we have a tension because even if we're trying to avoid that, uh, that difficulty, it may not be a difficulty that ministers themselves either recognize or are prepared to, uh, to, to, to row back on, as it were, um, to some extent, if the data is speaking differently. Um, another uh, question that caught my eye in the audience uh, was from Alison B. And she says, um, modelers need to be more representative of the population because we build in our biases as modelers. Um, Tim, you, you made the point about this is about the people who are the modelers. What, what would you say to that? If you look at our current population of modelers and we've got um, just purely in terms of gender representation, a very good representation here, but what, what does the wider world of modelers look like and, and is it looking like it should? Um, that's that's really quite interesting. And, and if you if you expand that out to transport planners, then it sort of gives the light to the to the to the, to the idea that that um, you know models and processes all come up always come up with the answer you should build more more roads and have big projects, which I would say the characteristic of transport planners is is that a lot of them come perhaps come with a view that that, that roads aren't the best thing and that perhaps we, sh we shouldn't be investing in things and more cars and i think transport transport modelers if if we have a bias is probably you know very heavily uh cycling uh focused uh gender balance i i certainly in the organization i'm working working in uh, the gender balance i i think is 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 is, is better than well better than many uh, engineering led <laughs> areas and, and improving all, all the time and our and our um, yeah so I so I think there's that but perhaps the point the, the key point is what communities do we come from you know if we come from sort of uh, the 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 metropolitan elite uh, educated classes, then perhaps we don't understand the day-to-day -day transport challenges of some of the people living in living areas that don't work in 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 the realms we do. It's come up a lot in COVID that we're all convinced that nobody's nobody's travelling to work. You know, like to loads of people go, oh, nobody's travelling. Look, here we are. Well, I'm, you know, we, we're all sitting at home working. We can all do our jobs from home. Well, we're we're a, 
we're a tiny bit of the population really and i know amanda for, from the dfd point of view you've got to think about think about everybody so in that in that sense i think we're you know we have some we, uh, our biases are probably I've actually changed my mind in the middle of the question. You tell, uh, it's, it's about us understanding who the other people are who aren't in our profession. And, and, and I think that's a really important point that when we're talking about modelers talking to modelers about their models and how they create them and populate them and interpret them, um, we're, we're missing the important wider audience, whether that be yeah. um, other transport planners who are not doing the modelling or indeed a much wider set of stakeholders. And I wonder, Charlene, you, um, in terms of what you'd set out with mu very much emphasizing the role of scenario planning, um, do, do you see, I mean, there's a comment made in the audience from Paul Furman about um, art versus science. Um, I guess, first of all, does the distinction matter? And do we see modeling as much as an art as perhaps it should be seen rather than a science for which there are rule books that you can learn by rote and then become a modeler? I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, Glenn, but I guess I see the value in having a wider range of people in these deliberation in trying to understand what, what are the areas we should be exploring in the models, what are the factors that impact um, how people may travel or um, and what are the options at, at that stage, I would say it's very much a mix between art and science, you know, coming up with potential solutions, understanding the realm of potential futures. Um, so I, I think it is a mix. I think um, the structure of a model is a very scientific process. However, people may have views about how you might include attitudes in those models or how you might include other um, explanatory variables that might not normally be included. There might be differing views about the level of segmentation that you have in a model versus how much time you spend on assignment. There's, you know, there's lots of philosophical questions about these models that people, you know, outside of modeling may have. So I can't remember what your question is, but I, <laughs> it's very much, um, you know, to, to get to the right transport solutions, it must be better to have a wider set of stakeholders provide input. Okay, I now I think you've done well with that question. Yeah, Tom, I'm, I'm coming to you and, and Helen in a moment, but yeah, do come in. No, no I, I think it's an important question and it sort of, it probably um, sort of um, picks up a few of the, the issues, I think, why modelers and, and planners sort of seem to be seen as, as, as at, at different ends of the spectrum. Um, I think that as a modeler, um, science is very important. We must estimate, Charlene said it all right, we must estimate our models in a, in a credible way, driven by data, using the right kind of techniques to establish these mathematical relationships and to be able to embed them into our, into our software products. But the understanding of behavior, the, the issues that play at a, um, at a societal level, um, they, they, they come from a wider range of people. And it's that interaction between modelers and planners and that exchange of idea, the art, if you want, you know, if you want to go there, that I think is, is so often missing. And there is a mistrust, I think, between the parties that we need to overcome. There needs to be confidence and trust that everybody is trying to do the right thing, whether they do trying to do thing, the right thing or whether they try to do things right, doesn't matter so much. That is, I think, where we, we should be going into in, in terms of this discussion. How do we build that trust and confidence? Thanks, Tom. And um, incidentally, with a slight with a wry smile, um, I think Tim particularly sort of spotted that I might have been out to cause some some mischief, uh, you know, within this session. And some in the audience at this point might be feeling a little little hard done by with their free ticket, notwithstanding it's free. But you know, so far we've not had much controversy. On the panel, we're, we're almost in violent agreement, it would seem. And, and I wonder whether the point here is that the it's not so much, at least within this gathering today, um, that we fundamentally disagree. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of synergy in the remarks, but what we're agreed upon is the enormous difficulty of what modelling is trying to deal with or what we are trying to achieve by using modelling. And what I'd like to ask the panel, I perhaps come to, come to Helen, but I was going to also ask Tom. Um, do you think, if I can come back to Stephen Craig's 
notion of this being about transport modeling philosophy. Do you think the philosophy that we seem to be sharing on the panel today is more widely bought into by the transport modeling and analysis profession as a whole? Helen, can I throw that one at you? Okay, I, I don't know if that's a joke because Glenn knows that I've, um, when I did my PhD recently, part time uh, at UE, I did quite a lot of thinking about why we're modelling and the philosophy behind it um, and uh, critical realism in particular as well, which very much advocates you don't just try and your model to replicate what's happening on the surface, but you dig below to the mechanisms that are, are, are at play. And also makes the point as well that when we build a model, we are setting boundaries. So we're abstracting from the world and we're saying this is the bit of the world we're looking at. And then while we're building the model, we tend to forget about the rest of the world. At least with us modelers, we've got it's a very challenging profession because when we are building a model, we do have to pay attention to detail to make sure that we're actually doing the modeling correctly and that we've handled the data correctly and so that it's not producing false evidence because of flaws we've introduced in, in the model itself. But then also we've got to have that breadth of understanding what else is going on in the world that might actually influence and have caused the model to produce a different um, understanding for us if we had included that in our model, if our, the boundary of our model had, had been different. Um, so, I mean, I actually did philosophy as part of my first degree and I just think it's really helpful that um, I have the benefit of being able to surround myself by better mathematicians than myself to deal with the detail, but also we need people who think about how truthful is this model or how, how useful is the evidence it's providing which I think comes to a point about the value of having multidisciplinary teams um, so, so that we all share our different insights into our activities. And just, 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 just for a moment, I think we need to be careful as well because we often criticize decision makers and say, they think the obvious answer is to like build a new road. As modelers, we can also fall into the danger of well, the obvious answer is to build a four-step model rather than stopping back and thinking, what's the bigger issue? What's the problem? What's the right approach? No, thank you, Helen. I'm, I'm going to suggest that, um, or the thought comes to my mind, um, that thinking philosophically about modelling is what changes a good modeller into a great modeller. Um, and without, you know, um, massaging the egos of our royalty on the panel, I think we've got great modellers before us, and, and you're demonstrating that ability to really think um, about the kind of you know the, the approach that one should be taking, um, and I suppose the challenge is whether we're providing in our education system uh, in, and in the way that modelers are being trained the right balance between the technical insight and, and this more philosophical perspective. Tom, just briefly before we turn to some of the pre-questions we had from the audience, um, what's your take? Do we think the philosophy that's out there in the wider community would resonate strongly with this panel's discussion, or are, are they some way? Um, adrift? Um, it's a tricky one. Um, I, rather than just sort of going into philosophy, I'm an engineer, so I didn't have the benefit that Helen had, um, is that um, there is there is definitely, I think, a uh, an, an issue about um, where modeling sits in, in our education system and the kind of focus that it is given in, in the courses that, that people people um, will be uh, exposed to in, in, uh, at universities, where it very much is a, um, uh, a, an element of transport planning that is driven by software products, that is driven by um, relatively uh, hard to understand mathematics, um, and that doesn't challenge whether you know, what we are doing at the moment is to some extent limited in its in its ability to reflect what the real questions are um turning on his head i think um i, I do think that 
by making models simpler and, and being able to and having them driven by the data, uh, allowing the data to tell us what the real questions are, we can start um, looking at, at the boundaries, whether those are behavioral boundaries, geographical boundaries, or other boundaries that we set on, on the mathematics that we, that, that we, that we use to, to resolve things. So I think that is where I would like to go from, a, if, if we're talking about philosophy, is, is, is exploring those boundaries in and out uh, and, and, and what the impact would be. And it could be about segmentation of population uh, and, uh, as well. And that might bring some of that, that, that great representativeness into the models too. Okay, thanks, Tom. And I just know, actually coming back to a point Helen made about what we're modeling and what we're not modeling, um, Danielle Snellen in the audience, and Danielle's done some excellent work on scenario planning. She says, um, it's very difficult to model something that's not in the data, such as staying at home for whatever reason. Um, and of course, it is difficult to model that if you're trying to model it with numerical data. Um, but as Charlene and I will know, and probably all on the panel will know, there are different types of model and scenario planning indeed does allow you in a qualitative way to model things which um, are not measured, um, which may be an important reminder that different types of models can work together to help overcome some of these challenges. But with that, what I'm gonna do, we, we shared some of the questions that the audience uh, had submitted in advance of today uh, with our panel, and I'm, I've asked them to have a think about one or two of the questions that really caught their attention. Uh, so we're going to have a round of going through that. Um, and I'm going to start with Charlene, please. What what caught your attention, Charlene, from those questions we received? Um, I was really caught by two um, questions from Lindsay Oxlid. Um, the first was around, did we agree that the disruption caused by COVID-19 and climate change highlight the, the um, need for new tools and approaches to deal with multiple future scenario planning, visualizations, collaborative forecasting and decision making? Um, I, I guess you wouldn't be surprised to hear that I think the answer is yes, 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 yes. Um, and, and, and I guess the point that, that I made earlier that it's really the combination of human beings thinking and computing that seems to best support the thinking needed in this complex environment, such as transport. So I, I did really like that question. I do think, I do think, as Amanda alluded to, and I and um, I saw some other questions, was you know, how do you communicate information when you're running many scenarios? So I, you know, only having seen the work of my colleagues, so. I have never done this in a transport context, but what you get down to is, is you're not saying, oh, in scenario A, this is better, and in scenario B, that's better, and therefore we should take an average in scenario C. What you're saying is things like, you know, in 95% of the future scenarios that we've explored that in, look at all these different variables, this is a very good this is a very good solution, and it really only fails to be a robust solution in the conditions X, Y, and Z. And in those conditions, we really need to think about, you know, what we could do to make the, um, the policy more robust, what, you know, what else we could do to try and support it in those conditions. So it's not that we're trying to say in, in this scenario, in that scenario, you, having run all these scenarios, you can then do a data analysis to really understand what are the most important factors what are the trade, you know, where does your solution work? Where doesn't, where it doesn't? And in what cases do you have to make those trade-offs? And I think, as I understand, um, is that actually policymakers can understand that sort of discussion, that they can understand that, you know, it, that these things largely work except in these conditions. Um, the second question I really liked was also from Lindsay Oxlid. And I found this a really, really difficult um, question. It was, the question was, what have we learned about the strengths and weaknesses of our existing modeling and analysis tools in responding to the need for plans and policies that are flexible and can be adapted to changing futures? Um, and I just wondered if that, the question, if I understood it correctly, is about the strengths and weaknesses of our models to be able to respond to adaptive strategies. And so, you know, the question is maybe as, as you introduce an intervention, people's attitudes and behaviors change, which then means the next intervention might have a, a different response. Um, 
I think that we don't do that very much. I, I know that people who are doing modeling and climate change do do that. I think we could learn more from them. Um, but I think, you know, in this kind of robust decision making framework, it allows you to make a lot of assumptions to say, well, what if they do do this? What if they do do that? And does that make a difference at the end of the day to the policies we want it to, to, to test? Because sometimes, you know, people can argue a lot about whether a response is going to be like this or that, but maybe that doesn't change the order of what would be the most, the best solution or the most robust solution in that domain. So maybe you don't even have to have those arguments. So I think that, you know, I think it's something we should be thinking about. I think it's a very clever question. I think we can learn from other people and it's something that, you know, perhaps we could think about ourselves too. Thanks, Charlene. And um, again, I keep I keep hearing reference to the word um, discussion, um, and I've just seen a comment from Anita uh, in the audience. Many hours are spent building models. Um, well, I think her, her question goes on to be something slightly different. But I think the proportion of time devoted by modelers and their wider network to discussion um, is not reflective of what's needed uh, compared to the proportion of time spent building models. Um, and calibrating and validating them. But let, let me move on in the interest of time. Tim, um, what caught your attention? Okay. Well, I, 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 just, just to have some controversy, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to just sort of pull the curtain back a little bit on this, what, what caught my eye. I was asked to deal with freight because nobody else wanted to. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, you know... So, so yeah, freight is 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 difficult. We had a question from Michael Whitaker about uh, how's freight and the logistics um, dealt with, and I I, well, I don't think we deal with freight at, at all in most of our, our model builds. We'll get we go sort of oh we'll 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 count the we'll, we'll think about the, the the travel demand and the personal trips. We'll we'll spend a lot of time calibrating that. We'll get some counts where we're fairly sure of where the HGVs are on the roads. And how many we want, um, and we'll say, has anyone got a freight matrix? Uh, and LGVs don't even start thinking about LGVs, so we don't we don't take it very seriously. Um, although, as famously quoted, LGVs for over twenty years have been the fastest growing, um, possibly the only really growing um, sector of our of our of our traffic. I think it's pre-COVID. It doubled in the last 20 years something like something like that and obviously under covid it's going to have a big impact but here's the thing that that that, that actually freight divides into two two categories one of them is real um logistics to, from 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 ports through distribution centers and major sort of manufacturing um supply chains the other is home delivery um in, in terms of goods and all the modelers and and certainly tag uh guidance when you when you look it goes oh hgvs and lgvs well no they're not hgvs and lgvs they are you know that that they are functions that we need to think about differently um and if we're to understand them the the, the thing that we do with tra with transport demand is we think in aggregate about all the people and this is this is how our models are, um, you know, why our sort of four stage models work well, because we have good aggregate behavioral assumptions. And maybe it's not right to, to it just isn't, hasn't proved to be possible to think in aggregate like that about freight, because each manufacturing chain, perishable goods versus versus white goods and, and different types of delivery um, to, 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 to customers, whether it's grocery or, or, or whether it's Amazon, they're all different and they're, they're, they're smaller firms and gig economy people making economic and operational decisions. Um, so we need, to, we need to take that into account and we're going to need to spend some time actually thinking about it, which, which we don't. Uh, we so have, I think, um, Pat, kind of paraphrasing and building on what you said, Tim, um, you're probably suggesting there aren't many models that currently deal with freight particularly well, if at all. No. So back to An Amanda's introductory remarks of you know, getting more from the models we already have, that may not be an option there. Um, 
what I see in my own mind is, as you rightly point out, function's important rather than, than form in terms of specific vehicle classes. But actually, there's an, a continue, continued merging between personal travel and freight in the sense that freight is now connecting directly with our front doors. Um, I'm told cargo bikes are really hard to get hold of right now because the order books are you know, going through the roof. Uh, and so you've got personal travel becoming goods movement. Uh, so we, we're barely scratching the surface of a phenomenon that is changing very quickly and could be very influential, as Amanda highlighted also in, in her opening remarks. Um, well, I'm with that, jump actually... jump in there, Glenn. Sorry, I'm going to jump in there. Because <laughs> this, 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 this leads me to another bugbear of mine, which is that um, in uh, modelling, but probably in transport planning more widely, we are not very good at... Uh, transferring work that is being done at universities to actual practical applications. Uh, I'm aware of quite a bit of work that's being done on, on that combination of personal tra travel and, um, and, and freight or logistics related uh, requirements uh, using Ubers to, to transfer parcels. Um, but that is uh, that is still very much in, in sort of the academic area. There's no there's no attempt to try and work out how we could embed that knowledge into either our, our four stage models or you know, some kind of representation in our strategic models. And that's that's where we need to be better as well. Uh, and we we continue to fail. And uh, I, I, when I speak to academics, it's 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 our job as practitioners to make sure that we read their papers and and and, and make use of all that wisdom. And when I speak to practitioners, you know, our, our job is hard enough as it is, and um, you know um, we need to get more value out of out of academic uh, uh, academics actually solving the real world problems rather than rather than doing the blue sky thinking. So um, maybe one one back from me to you. How are we going to solve that? Well, I, I, I think it probably needs a paradigm shift again in how we interpret modelling, because I think traditionally, in, as you know, in research, Tom, it's going from, from data to information to knowledge, to translating that knowledge into techniques and theories and application of those theories, which you know, emerge into the practitioner's tools. Um, and I just think at the moment, the, the dynamics, the state of flux is so great um, that it's really hard to keep up with this in the traditional way we've done things. Um, in the IT sector, they they talk about agile development. You know, you don't set, you don't have a waterfalling approach which has a two year project lifespan where you carefully agreed all the objectives at the beginning and then go through a process and deliver a report. You say let's just get in and do something quick. Um, it won't be quite right. But we'll learn about what wasn't quite right as we do it, and then we'll adjust it and move on. And I think adaptive modeling in that sense probably is something we need to be giving more attention to. Um, but I'm going to give the floor to Amanda now in terms of um, what caught your attention from the questions before, or indeed from remarks you're hearing that you can't resist coming back in on. <laughs> I was interested by the question about what tools should be developed to allow policy decision makers to develop policies that might work well under one future, but may be adapted easily and quickly to other contexts. But I did interpret this as a non-modeler, as policy tools rather than modeling tools, so possibly a little different to the others. Um, uh, now, it seems to me, well, from a DFT perspective, we, we start by looking at the, the sort of wide portfolio of projects. And I think in that, it, it's really important that we run different scenarios to see how that portfolio performs, um, because what we need is a mix of projects that will give decent transport solutions under a range of things that might happen. Um, so looking at one alone doesn't give you the answer. It's the right, it's the right collection. Uh, I mean, within that, then clearly there'll be some projects that are sort of a, a, a spine of the system, some major roads perhaps, uh, which, are, which, which have a core role in any situation. And those are things where, which are absolute, you know, things to support. Um, uh, but similarly, the ability to uh, adapt um, uh, is, is an important part of a project and those projects will get a, will get a, will get a tick. Um, we should also, within this, it's helpful to think about when the uncertainty might be resolved and whether there's a case for delaying, staggering um, projects. So there's quite a lot of interesting thinking. And I think that's where the quick models um, would be really helpful. So you can look at the portfolio quite flexibly and understand what's going on there. 
I would also say that there's that there are some wider points here of which which aren't generally thought about by modelers, which is what is driving the the um, wider transport behaviors. So if our model suggests there are issues in area X, are there some wider things about why people are using the system in that way, which we should be thinking about? Um, and similarly, from the other perspective, just looking at people's motivation, the behaviors, um, and what will people be sensitive to in, in, in information? I mean, one huge thing that struck me forcibly when I arrived in DFT was, um, and it's a slightly provocative statement, is if I thought about my transport over the preceding five years, the thing that had made the biggest difference to it by a huge margin was the development of transport apps. And there we were in the department looking at spending billions upon billions of pounds, but we weren't for very good reasons, talking particularly much about, about the apps because they were outside the system. But how do those change people's behaviours and what should we know about those? So I think we're looking here at an interface between the models and the other dimensions that, that as policymakers and as, 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 a, as a transport, wider transport community, how can those come together to get the optimal, to get the, the optimal, um, to get the optimal outcomes. And I'd like, we, we were talking earlier about bringing a, a diversity of people into the room, into the profession. I think I would also make a strong bid there for um, people with social research experience, with behavioral research insights to bring their research and sit it really at the heart of how we think about our models and how we interpret them. The last point I would make in response to some of the questions, um, there, there was a sort of sense I think people may have interpreted my comment about ministers' intuitions as ministers thinking they know the answer and wanting the model to fit that. And clearly all of us have an intuition which is based on all sorts of things that, that, that we sort of predispose towards. But I think if you're making huge decisions, I think people are generally open to understand what's behind the model and critical is explaining why the model does it, what it does, however complicated, however counterintuitive, trying to explain that in a way which gets someone to believe it is is important yeah no and, and you make a, a very important general point of course that all of us inescapably are subject to unconscious bias so mm. much as we might like to think we're objective and have kind of homed in on a singular objective truth um, we're, we're likely to be wrong um, I love the idea that you know apps should have been the thing perhaps that was spotted earlier um, one wonders now whether apps have become teams and zoom. Um, and indeed, I firmly believe that whatever Teams and Zoom feels like today, it's going to be very different in five years' time. So goodness knows how we're picking up on that. Um, right, I must get to, to Tom and Helen for what they would like to draw out from the, uh, the questions. Tom. Yeah, um, thanks, Glenn. Um, just to add to um, Amanda's point around uh, apps, uh, I saw recently some um, some numbers around traffic growth on unclassified roads, which is... Uh, is ascribed to sat navs for you know, who have found uh, which are now used to find um, rat runs that were never available or never visible to people and um, so so again um, if you don't know that it's happening you can't actually build it into your models to explain and to to move move forward with that and uh, it's first that understanding and then sort of thinking about how we can build it into, into our models. Um, one of the questions that, that struck me was a question from Joshua Zhao, um, who said, um, one way to reduce uncertainties is um, by using different models, different model forms, different uh, model assumptions, and try to answer the same question and see if you get the same answer. And if not, you know, there must obviously be something going on here. What is the assumption that, that you have made either in the theory or in the, the data that you use or in the boundaries that you set that lead to that particular answer? So his question is, um, is strategic modeling as we use it at the moment uh, uh, lacking variety? Um, now, I used to think, um, I was quite a supporter of the single version of the truth, as we as we as modelers sometimes like to say. You know, at least uh, it's wrong, but at least we know it's wrong, and we all use the same wrong information. Um, but nowadays, I, I I get I get what he says. Um, says, and I'm quite open to using different models, different model forms, different assumptions. It broadens our insights. Now, uh, what did um, Charlene say? 
I made some notes somewhere. Facilitates discussion. Yeah. So let's 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 be more open to that. Let's let's be uh, willing to engage in 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 uh, exploring what, if the answers can change. If if you um, if you make different modeling assumptions, do different modeling techniques. But we must be willing to be open about that um, that that uncertainty. Why is it that these these uh, um, these answers change, um, and and I think perhaps that the the uncertainty that we have to now deal with, both in terms of we've seen changes in travel behaviour way before COVID occurred, we we see new modes such as uh, e scooters and, and and shared mobility uh, arrive, uh, CAVs maybe sometime in the future. We, we have learned to deal with uncertainty. So maybe this is, can be a driver to embrace that uncertainty as a, as a good thing so that we can, can increase the robustness of, um, of our analyses. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm, I, I think that uh, we are, as a, as a modeling profession, possibly uh, lacking variety in the way in, in which we build models and uh, the data that we use to build models. Um, and that brings me to final point on that is um, I have never believed that web tag or tag uh, forces this lack of variety. This, this is potentially something that we can point back at ourselves as modelers that it that we have fallen into a bit of a straitjacket here and have stopped looking for uh, for new new approaches. Uh, that's one question. Second question that I thought quite interesting. I mean, I grew up as an equilibrium modeler. Probably most people of my generation did, and I still believe there's a huge value in it. And and, and Richard Bradley asks: Now we've got increased flexibility for our daily activities, and a critical need to return to unmanageable peak period, con period congestion. Should we continue to spend so much time on highly converged equilibrium assignment models? And I say yes, absolutely yes. Um, because equilibrium is 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 a concept of of, of stability of, of proximity some kind of an optimum, um, and I don't think that any of the reasons that 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 uh, Richard says, sets out there changes that this this is the way in which we yeah you know, we build a framework of 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 generating uh, numerical outputs that are um, that are that that are that are, that are robust. Um, and I don't think in terms of behavior, people's behavior has changed fundamentally. Their perceptions of, their value of certain aspects of travel or not to travel has not changed fundamentally. The, op the opportunities have changed. The, um, the, um, the choices that they have have changed. Um, but their valuation, I have not seen any evidence that their valuation of that has changed. And certainly, because we need to more use model results in downstream applications, such as economic appraisal, but also environmental analyses, we need to have that stability in our model results. Otherwise, we're comparing um, uh, numbers with, with high, high, high amounts of noise in them. Um, what I do need, think we can, can, can talk about what might need to change is, uh, is four things. One is... Oh, you can't have all four, Tom. Come on. <laughs> Go I'll on, give you. I'll give you three then. <laughs> yeah, the choice alternatives. The choice alternatives are changing. Uh, public transport is a, is a good one. Um, our assumptions about the future um, obviously have have changed compared to to pre COVID, and um, I think we need to do a, 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 a more, be more open to a review of the way in which some of the uh, things that affect people's choices can or cannot be represented in our current models. Thinking about things as landscape, concerns about climate change, health concerns, or, or issues around reliability, which we conveniently, like freight, Tim, uh, tend to sort of stick in this sort of, well, it's, it's too difficult and we will just have to proxy it by something that fits the model, uh, rather than trying to say, well, we need to actually change our models to reflect some of those important components of people's decision making as well. Thanks, Tom. Um, I can't resist coming back just, just by way of observation. You, you started saying partway through, um, I don't believe in tag. And I thought there was going to be a full stop after tag, but you went on to say um, forcing lack of variety. So 
I think you know, I said breed, I don't all, believe that tag rather than <laughs> in tag. Like. We, we, all, we all breathe a sigh of relief anyway. Um, right, over, over to Helen. Okay, I was uh, really wanting to... Uh, two things. I'll come to a question in a moment. Quickly, I want to get back at Tom. I think there is a place for equilibrium models, but I think there's also a place for models that never reach an equilibrium state at all. I think for sometimes when we're looking at understanding and to be able to provide evidence to support policy decisions, models, for instance, agent-based models, which actually are modeling how a system is continually changing, can provide a lot of value and um, insights. For instance, I know of a model that looked at um, bus usage over time and that how even introducing bus passes wasn't able to prevent the vicious decline in bus use. Um, so I just think this equilibrium models have a use as well. Um, going back to these questions, um, I've also caught my eye with the question from Anita, which does say that we do spend a lot of hours building our models, but we spend very little time checking if the forecasts are accurate. And I feel as modelers, we should be always learning. And one of the things I think is really important is if our models, if, if the world turned out to be different than what we thought from our model, why? Um, and she's asking us, are we aware of any research looking into the accuracy of models? There is some, and there's the Pope studies from High Rose England, but there's hardly any. And I think it's in a way, we've got ourselves into a structural trap in the way that modelling is commissioned, that this evaluation exercise and going back and talking to the modellers saying, well, why hasn't things happened the way you thought? Um, a lot of this post-evaluation of models doesn't actually go back and talk to the modellers and say, well, what were your assumptions? And it often doesn't actually look at what was happening in the context, what was happening in the wider world that caused the predictions to be different, the outcome to be different from predictions. And we need to learn. And that might be how we adapt our current models or how actually we should have adopted a different modeling approach to tackle that question. Yeah, thanks Helen. And I think there's a, a key question, of course, about time and resource to do these things, which which are indeed important, but will are they ever at the top of the to-do list amongst other things? I am also reminded to, to just a bit of applaud it really for DFT that you know it does go back and revisit road traffic forecasts uh, in retrospect with the right input data, which it didn't know at the time. Uh, and whether or not it's right for the wrong reasons, it's actually rather good. Um, and so, you know, I think some of that's happening, but you're right probably not enough. Um, I do want to come back as, as we start to draw to a close. Um, Paul Furman asks quite rightly what he calls the $64,000 question, although I think Jeff Bezos wouldn't even get out of bed to make a cup of tea for that these days, Paul, so it probably needs to be a higher number. Um, does the panel think that COVID will impact on modelling to any extent? And if I can just turn that into a slightly different question to do a quick straw poll for the panel, and I don't think it's particularly controversial, but um, do you think COVID will be marked um, as an episode that significantly disrupts our modelling paradigm in the fullness of time. So hands up if you think this is a period which will be significant for shaping the future of modelling. Okay, we've got a... I'm half I'm not up. sure. You, you, can, you can remain resolute to keep your hand down. So we've got um, not quite unanimity. Helen's got... Say something, Helen. I need to know why you're... Resisting. I'm, a bit fear, I'm a bit fearful that we'll go back in a couple of years and we'll collect a new set of input data, but whether we'll actually stop to reflect on whether we should be changing our models or we'll just put this new data into our old models. Um, yeah, okay. So we're, we're happy to allow you to be non-committal on that. Um, well, um, what I'd like to do, we may... Um, got 10 minutes left but I'd like you to be having a think about um, what would be your your takeaway message um, for the audience. Um, I did note uh, a question from Ivan Stead just before that um, and he asks to what extent does the appropriate use of scenarios depend on 
whether we're trying to get a go no go decision on the scheme, design a scheme, or allocate a budget amongst a list of potential schemes. Is that is, is Ivan pointing at yet another immeasurably challenging dimension to all of this, that all of our discussion is predicated on, well, what actually were we particularly thinking about as the, as the use case for the modelling when we were offering our answers? Um, I don't know whether anyone would, I'm not going to ask the whole panel, but if somebody feels an immediate spark to say, yes, that, that needs responding to. Any takers? My, I, I thought, thought of for the phrase that, um, all, all models are, are wrong, especially the ones that don't agree with the project that I was trying to promote. Um, and, <laughs> or maybe all models that, 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 that show my project is a good idea are definitely right. So um, we, I think we can, we can riff off of this all models are wrong phrase mm -hmm. for, for, a, for a long time. I can't help thinking there's something along the lines of um, models can appear right for all the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but they can never be right for all the people yeah. all of the time. Let's, let's try that. Okay. Um, if each of you would like then to, to come back and I'll just work around on my screen. So I'll come to you first, Tim. Um, there's been a lot for us to take in this afternoon. Uh, and indeed, we've probably got many questions in the chat bar, which we'll in, enjoy going back yeah. to afterwards to properly digest. But what have you made of the session and what would be your kind of main takeaway either for yourself or for the audience? Um, I think, I think the extent to which the modelers all, all agree is all, 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 all very, all very nice. So the, the points of, I think disagreement is I'm, I'm still very much minded to say that I, I don't really want to see, 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 see the great change coming in talking about the mod, what's in the modeling box. I think the modeling box is the bit we should always look at last. And we've got to think about the, the questions that people are asking and what they understand when they come to them to, to something that they think is modeling. Um, and the people who are going to do that. And when I, I, I do worry when I hear, um, you know, we should go to non-equilibrium modeling and, 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 and particularly activity-based modeling and interfaces with, uh, with universities more. I would love that. I would love to spend lots of time on all of that. And a lot of modelers would, but we, we, we are in process mode a lot of the time of answering the questions that our, that our clients have got now. So if we're going to shift, we've got to think about how we shift within that, within those constraints um, and, and taking, taking people with us. My, my brain doesn't cope with more than a couple of modeling projects at a time on the, the complexity of what I know already. So transforming, transforming me and all the people I'm working with to, to thinking something, something else is difficult. But, and also those models then become, to, to my mind, we're doing predictive aggregate modeling all the time for clients because they want predictive. What we're talking about with new things is often exploratory. It's a different thing. It's a, it's a, Ooh, what happens if, can we understand this differently? So it's a different question from the client and I'd love it. I'd love to be doing it, but we need, we need to create the space. Okay. And I, I think your points are well made about you. you you're, you're already struggling to cope with the, the demands already as, as, the, as the others are, others in the community are. You know, maybe the answer is not, not loading more expectation on the existing modeling community, but expanding that community to pick up the points on diversity, but also diversity of discipline and, and types of models that we talked about earlier. Um, Amanda. Thank you. Timing perhaps good as the points I was intending to make are, are pretty well identical to what Tim has already said. Um, reflecting through the, quite a lot of agreement, but you did manage to unpick a, a few disagreements there with great effort, Glenn, but not, not, a, not, not a vast <laughs> number. I mean, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for using models more strategically, looking at new ways of doing things with models, and actually quite large barriers to change with clients wanting a particular thing and a, and a sort of, you know, different people with different demands without really the space to be exploratory. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose I, I mean, as DFT, we are very keen to play a part in, in, in the system in encouraging change. And I think, I think we do. Um, but talking to people about what would be useful. And, and again, using tag, I mean, it's large already. We don't want to make it any more. 
large but flexible, I think is the way I would see it. We don't want to make it more um, more uh, difficult to use, but um, but yeah, we'd like to play a part in that. The one bright spot that does spark, strike me is there's a, I mean, there's a huge flourishing of, of modeling outside the transport modeling community and people who are looking at transport from a data science perspective. Um, I mean, it tends not to be answering the same questions as transport modelers, and we shouldn't confuse intense activity and beautiful, beautiful moving pictures with actually the requirement to reliably predict or, or sensibly predict what might happen, but actually making a real effort to open up that relationship and seeing whether there's more we can do with, within that. I know Charlene's been doing interesting work on that, is potentially a way forward. Um, but right. and it's been really interesting, uh, great group uh, discussion to be part of. And um, and I think there's more we can do, but but it's not not easy. Great. Thanks, Amanda. And I must just pick up in relation to your, your point in terms, I suppose, about the um, how much how much change is possible in a short space of time for for the modeling community. Uh, Douglas Gilmore, um, I, I won't encourage you to answer the question in, in the interest of time, but I will read it out to quote Microsoft. Two years of tech development has been rolled out in two months due to COVID. Why don't we see the same happening in the modeling world? Uh, you know, I think we are facing monumental challenges and can we afford to simply accept that change is not going to be quick um, when we may be overtaken by events? Anyhow, thank you both and over to Helen. I would just summarise by saying I think we need to believe in ourselves as a profession and the value of what we can bring to discussions, both the value of our evidence and the value of the understanding that we gain through building the models. And maybe as a profession, we need to be more assertive and less apologetic and uh, own, own our seat at the table. Great, thanks, Helen. Tom? I'm never apologetic. <laughs> um... <laughs> But, but, but it, is, it is, as I said around earlier, about confidence and trust. And, and that is a, a two-way process for me. And, and, and if um, somebody asked the question and that, that five the panelists sort of perhaps agreed on, on sort of will COVID be seen as a, as, a, as, a, as a point at which things change? It wouldn't be around new methods and new, 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 um, new approaches. It will be uh, around a different way in which we use models. And I've seen in... You know, in the response, right, certainly at the beginning of using models and even models that certainly were not quite right and had been developed for, for different purposes, how they helped decision making in a very difficult environment. And there were different models and different numbers, um, but they were used. They were not necessarily always treated with, I think, the uh, respect, for lack of a better word, for the people that had put a lot of effort into this and put their, their, their name and their whole reputation on the line. Uh, for decision makers to have evidence in, uh, in in very difficult decisions with winners and losers, as we often see in transport projects as well. So that is what I what I would would, would take away, which I would really like the, the 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 continuation of discussion to be with the 500 or 700 people that that may have dialed in. Is how do we actually use the tools that we've got, the people the really clever people, the committed people that we've got in the modeling profession to open that discussion up, to build that trust and to use the models that we've got better and the model results that we've got. And the and even the, the uncertainties that exist in a way that help us in understanding that compl complex world out there as well. Uh, I've called that explain and explore. Um, and um, uh, I do believe that there's, there's, there's something that we need to build up there. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Tom. And Charlene? Yeah, I'm going to end agreeing with Tom. I think that um, whilst I don't think that the uncertainties that COVID have brought are something that I think it's something we should have been thinking about in the way we use our models, I do think it, what it does is illustrates this uncertainty that I think a lot of people didn't feel really existed. So, you know, questions about whether urbanization trends would continue, that seemed to be kind of known, a known fact that urbanization would continue. And I think what COVID has done is it's, in, it's shown us that we don't know that. And therefore, I think that what COVID will do is it will make us more cognizant of these uncertainties. And therefore, we're going to have to think about ways that we can deal with those. I think I agree with Helen that I think the models that we develop are very 
clever and use the latest science and are really evidence led and based on um, based on data. I think, but I think we can learn from what other people do. And it's this kind of balance of trying to take what we bring to the table, but also see what other people are doing and, and taking the best from what they're doing too. And I guess that's always been for me, the best way to learn is, you know, to either be collaborating with people at universities to bring new things into models or to look at how other um, sectors do things to try and explore different ways of, of the way that we could use our models. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know what I'm finishing on, but I just believe that, you know, we're bringing a lot to the table, but we have stuff to to learn and we and, and it's really around how we use our models. I also want to add to Tom, I do know a place where two models were developed and we'll, we can finish where we started with Hugh Gunn. So um, the very fast train analysis in Australia, you two separate teams were commissioned to do the analysis with two separate models, two separate analyses. Um, and so that I always thought that was interesting. And I am aware that in some of the work that people do around robust decision making, you can easily you know, one of the variants in the futures analysis can be different models and, and people do do that. And, you know, maybe you find that actually it, it didn't matter, although the answers are different, the priorities may not be. That's great. Thanks, Charlene. Um, and I think I'll just finish by saying uh, it feels as though I've got back to where we started, which is the importance of philosophy uh, in transport modelling. Um, I think we need to focus some more and this session has helped greatly on the guiding principles for modelers' behaviours. So I'll leave it there. It's been a fantastic discussion and I think discussion is the key word that's come through strongly. A huge thank you to the panellists um, for all your energy, enthusiasm and willingness to engage, as indeed to our fantastic audience. The, the chat bar has been alive throughout and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Thank you all ever so much. And now back to Brogan to, to close the proceedings. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to the panel again. It was a really interesting conversation. Um, the chat was a lot of fun as well. Um, and just to say that we'll have another fireside chat in the new year. So we'll see you then. Bye. Excellent. Bye. Thank you.